the episode kicks off with the usual courtroom pleasantries. Everyone's saying hello and looking spiffy. Jerome, the trusty court officer, steps up to the mic and drops the name of today's dramatic face-off, Lewis versus McAllister. Just a typical day in court, right? Hang on tight, it's just getting started. Please be seated. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. This is a case of Lewis versus McAllister. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Good morning. Mr. Lewis, you say you've always known the defendant is your father. Judge Lake lays down the facts with a bit of flair. Mr. Lewis is convinced Mr. McAllister is his old man, despite McAllister's firm nope on the matter. Today's DNA test might just end a mystery older than some fine wines. Buckle up, folks. This courtroom roller coaster is about to take off. You hope today's result put an end to this 44 year year old mystery. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. McAllister, you claim that years of doubt have given you reason to believe that you are not father, but you may know who is. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. You are ready to prove your case today. Mr. Lewis takes the stage and shares a heartfelt tale of growing up fatherless in South Central Los Angeles. He talks about the tough times and the empty chair at dinner. It's more than just a sob story. It's his life. And today, he's hoping for some long-awaited answers. Next up, does Mr. McAllister keep dodging daddy duty? How has Mr. McAllister's denial affected you? Well, growing up in South Central Los Angeles, it was tough not having a father there. You know, knowing that you have one, you know, there's different things that went on through my life that, you know, not having a, a man there to answer different questions, you know, it, it made things a lot tough. It was a lot tougher for me coming up, you know, but thank God that everything worked out. Mr. McAllister fires back with why he's been dodging the dad label, tossing out a buffet of conflicting stories that would confuse anyone. He reminisces about a brief fling with Mr. Lewis's mom after a high High school dance gone wild. Hold on, because this paternity puzzle is about to throw us another curveball. Testimony. Yes, I do. It was very difficult growing up knowing he had a dad, that he was nowhere to be found. Yes, ma'am. Why is that? Were you doubtful all of these years? Yes, ma'am. And the reason why I was doubtful, because I heard maybe three or four different versions of who the dad was, and that put doubt in my mind. And um, I would just like to know before I leave here, the actual truth is, Dive into the details of a single steamy night that might have started it all, courtesy of Mr. McAllister's trip down memory lane. He thought it was just a fleeting high school romance, but surprise, it could have left a lifelong legacy. What's coming will make your jaw drop. What was the nature of your relationship with Mr. Lewis's mother? Me and uh, Miss Lewis, we had attend the uh, same high school together, and I knew her as, as a casual friend. However, the young lady that I was dating at the time, we either had our differences or whatever, and somehow my, uh, Mrs. Lewis hooked up for an evening and um, never talked to her from that point on. Now, Mr. Lewis paints a vivid picture with words about his mom's influence, complete with an actual photo of McAllister as potential pops. It's a poignant peek into his past hopes and heartaches, but keep those tissues handy. There's more emotion to unpack. Well, my mom was, you know, because the type of woman she was, she didn't want to allow the turmoil from that interfere with my life. But as a what, woman, what we had to What did she say specifically? She let me know who he was as a father. She had a picture of him. She gave me this picture. And so when you got this picture and you had the name, did you ever say, I want to look for him? Where is is he? Yeah, at that point in my life, I, I definitely wanted to know who he was. Just when you thought it couldn't get more tangled, Mr. McAllister reveals a plot twist from 81. A random family reunion turned intel drop leads him to question everything he thought he knew about fatherhood. The saga continues, and it's about to get even juicier. I traveled um, to Los Angeles back in 81, and I ran into a relative of the family. And this individual told me that um, their relative had my son. And I got the information, and I called Mrs. Lewis, and I asked her, do we need to talk about something? And she said, no. I said, what about your son? Um, what's What's going on there? I heard X, Y. She said, his dad is dead. I said, his dad is dead. She said, yes, his dad is dead. With each recount of the conflicting paternity tales, Mr. McAllister's doubt grows thicker than a plot in a soap opera. He's here today to cut through the rumors with the sharp blade of DNA truth. But don't wander off. The real bombshell is just moments away. It has been determined by this court. Mr. McAllister, you are the father. All right, gather around, folks, because Phelan Hannon is about to drop a real bombshell in court today. Phelan Hannon shares her story about growing up believing one man was her father until he denied paternity when she was 13. Her mother confessed on her deathbed that another man, the defendant David Dorsey, is her biological father. Phelan is seeking to prove paternity and gain closure. If you thought your family reunions were awkward, just wait until you see what's coming next. Miss Hannon, you grew up believing one man was your father until the age of 13 when he said, I am not your daddy. Yes, ma'am. Your mother then told you on her deathbed that another man, the defendant David Dorsey, is your biological father. 
Talk about a tough call. Imagine calling your dad to invite him to a daddy-daughter dance, and instead of a yes, you get a find-your-real-dad bombshell. A dramatic moment occurs when Phelan recalls this painful memory from her childhood. The man she believed to be her father rejected her. The audience can't help but gasp, and trust me, it only gets wilder from here. Instead of his response being, yes, I'll be there, it was, your mother's still lying to you, not your dad, you need to go find your real dad. How cruel. <sighs> I know that had to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> At what point did your mother tell you about David Dorsey? My mom, we would have our heart to hearts, you know, when she got sick, she was sick my whole entire life. You know, she would be talking about Kimball, she would talk about David. On her deathbed, she told me, I thought I picked the right one for you, but David's your father. Enter David Dorsey, the man of the hour, who literally could not have been more aloof if he tried. He walks into the courtroom, barely glancing at Phelan. He expresses doubt about being Phelan's father, claiming he does not remember her mother at all, which surprises the audience. Brace yourselves, the plot thickens. Mr. Mm -hmm. Dorsey. How you doing? Thank you for joining us today. This young woman has waited many, many years to meet you. She's been told that you are her biological father. Yes, ma'am. You walk through the doors, you walk right past her, no hug. You didn't even really look at her, acknowledge her. I acknowledged her. I looked at her. You don't believe you're her biological father? Not really. Why? Because I don't remember her mother at all. You don't remember her mother? I don't know her mother. You don't know her mother? No. Just when you thought it couldn't get more dramatic, Phelan's godmother, Cassandra Alexander, steps up to the witness stand. She drops some serious receipts, providing evidence of Dorsey's link to Phelan's mother. She recalls seeing Dorsey bring lunch to Phelan's mother at work and mentions their relationship, contradicting Dorsey's claims of not knowing her. Oh, and it's about to get even juicier, so hang tight. Miss Hannon, you brought a witness with you. Yes, ma'am. I believe it's your godmother. Yes, ma'am. Please stand, ma'am, and state your name for the court, please. My name is Cassandra Alexander, and I am Phelan's godmother and I was a very good friend, um, Fallon's mother, Veronica Hanna. And what information can you provide? Well, Your Honor, me and Fallon's mother, Veronica, we work together. Melody Dorsey, possibly the sister of the century, confidently claims Fallon as her sister, all but sealing the deal with her testimony about their uncanny resemblance and shared background stories. She describes their father as a well-known figure in the community, further supporting the possibility of his paternity. Get ready, because this family tree is about to get a few more branches. Miss Dorsey, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You know we are here discussing the paternity as it relates to Ms. Hannon. I'm here to claim my sister. <laughs> That's my sister. I don't mean to disrespect my dad, but my dad was a Rolling Stone. So he was the man, and like he was very known on the North Side for being David Watkins, you know, the slayer of women. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the I, slayer yeah, of, of women. women. Okay. As if a daytime drama script got lost and ended up in court, David Dorsey shares his emotional turmoil over the situation, reflecting on the possibility that if Phelan is indeed his daughter, he has missed 30 years of her life. This deeply emotional moment highlights his conflicted feelings about the paternity uncertainty. Fasten your seatbelts. The emotional roller coaster is not over yet. What <laughs> was it that made you want to come today? I mean, if you've never met this woman and you have never had sex, and you don't know what is going on, why did you come? I want closure for Fallon. And I see that makes you emotional when you talk about her. Why is that? I feel sorry for her. Is there any part of you that says, if she is my daughter, if it was an encounter, I just don't remember this young woman, this beautiful, smart young woman, I've missed out on her life? Yeah. Drum roll, please. Mr. Dorsey, you are not the father. Well, isn't this a dramatic start? The court session kicks off as the judge allows everyone to be seated and the case of short Fifu Johnson is announced. Grab your popcorn because this is just the beginning. You may be seated. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of short versus Johnson. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. <laughs> Here's where the plot thickens. Ms. Short steps up, a single teenage mom ready to drop a bombshell. She's claiming Mr. Johnson, her so-called first love, denies paternity of her 21-month-old son Jabari and insists he needs to man up and play dad. Oh boy, you'll want to see how he reacts. Ms. Short, you and your mother opened your case today because your first love, the defendant, denied fathered your 21-month-old son Jabari. You are a single teenage mother who needs help and you demand Mr. Johnson step up and be 
be a father. Is that correct, Your Honor? Hold on to your hats, folks. In a twist of events, Mr. Johnson, joined by his mother, admits he was indeed Ms. Short's first love, but suggests he wasn't her only love. He's calling for a DNA showdown before he steps into the daddy role for Jabari. The tension is mounting, and it's about to get even spicier. You are in court with your mother and say you might have been the plaintiff's first love, but you weren't the only one. You refuse to do anything for her son until the DNA results prove are his biological father. Is that correct? Yes, you are. Emotions are about to get the best of them. Mia Short's mom, Sylvia, steps into the fray, pleading for clarity on Jabari's paternity, so Mr. Johnson can either step up or step out. She's been playing defense to keep emotions in check, blocking Mr. Johnson from too much contact just in case he's not the dad. What comes next? Well, you guessed it. It's a tearjerker. He's the father of my son, and my son, as a boy, need a father fit, and I need extra help, like, don't, while I'm in school. <laughs> We gotta do this for Jabari, stop. She just need to know, is he the father? So he can step up and do the right thing, hopefully. You know, we can't make him, him for coming over because I didn't want no feelings to get involved. Them to get attached if he wasn't the father because she did tell them it's a possibility you may not be the father. Plot twist, Ms. Short opens up about her heartbreak, catching Mr. Johnson on Facebook with another woman and his cold dismissal of their relationship. This heartache leads her straight into the arms of another man, further tangling the web of who Jabari's dad might be. You won't believe how this love triangle unravels. I seen him on Facebook with another female and he was like, I don't want you. I want her. He was talking about the other female. He just left. He just left me. <laughs> After that happened, it was May 3rd. We, I went out to eat with some friends. And okay. That night, I had met the other boy. And this is not my first time meeting him, but this is the first time we ever had sex. I'm like, well, Mr. Johnson don't care about me. Why not? Okay. Did I, you say, I'm pregnant and you're the father? I said possibility. Just when you think it can't get any more dramatic, Mr. Johnson, possibly cornered by his feelings and the rumors swirling around, vows to be there for Jabari if the DNA test proves he's the father. But doubts are creeping in fed by whispers from friends about the other potential dad. Stick around, the drama isn't over yet. I found out about the baby, and I talked to Miss Short on the phone. I told her if he was mine, I was going to be there for her. I was going to help her with the baby. But when I got out and then her friends started telling me that, that's when I started having my doubts. Did you know your friends, Miss Short, was telling Mr. Johnson he may not be the child's father? She was like, because I was like, it was a possibility. So I was like, I'm scared to let moms know. She was like, you need to let them know. After that, I called her. It's a possibility that Mr. Johnson can be the father of my son. And now, for some family feud vibes. Ms. Mabry, Mr. Johnson's mother, recounts her offer of support to Ms. Short amidst the paternity chaos. She's been trying to play nice, but the uncertainty and gatekeeping are really starting to wear her down. Let's see how they navigate this sticky situation. And you said to her, if you need anything, just let me know. Yes, and it also went further into a blood test. They wanted me to do a blood test. Other dude saying he wanted to know if Demise was the father, if Demise's not the father. I'm not gonna go through all that. And another Another thing about the baby, when we try to get the baby, she have to come and sit with us. We can't get the baby, and she talking about flexing and fronting and all this baby, even though we know it was a possibility that it's not my son, yeah. baby. Judge Lake dives into detective mode, trying to piece together the puzzle of Jabari's paternity based on a timeline of romantic encounters. She's looking for the slightest clue that could tip the scales. Watch closely as she tries to untangle this messy timeline. I had my due date was January 4th. Okay. I had him January 8th. I had sex with Mr. Johnson April 23rd. And May 3rd, just too close. So, Miss Short, the bottom line is, is the other person that was a, a possibility. You reached out to them as well to say that it is a possibility that he could be the biological father. You also know that Mr. Johnson is a very real possibility because of the proximity of the time you had sex with Mr. Johnson and the time you had sex with the other guy, right? Yes, Your Honor. Here comes a curveball. A letter from Mr. Johnson to Miss Short surfaces, full of promises and fatherly pledges, written in a moment of believed paternity. It's heartfelt. It's hopeful. It's complicated. Just when you think think you've seen it all, there's more to unpack. So this is a communication between you and Mr. Johnson. He writes, I'll be there for you and my child. I love all mine. That one thing you ain't got to worry about, I'm going to be a great father to my children. So he wrote that letter and promised you in that moment that he was going to be a good father to his child and believed, it seemed, that it was his child. Do you remember writing that, Mr. Johnson? I remember. Fasten your seatbelts for this one. The DNA results are finally revealed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Johnson, you are the father. Like I said.
Get this, Ms. Moore and her sister Shalwanda strut into court with a plot twist worthy of a soap opera. They've been led to believe all their lives that Mr. Moore is their pops, but lo and behold, their mom recently dropped the paternity bomb on them. The courtroom drama unfolds with accusations of paternity fraud against their mother, Ms. Willis. Talk about family dinner going sideways. Ms. Moore, you and your sister Shawanda grew up believing that Mr. Moore is your father, but are now in court suing your mother for paternity fraud because she recently dropped um and revealed that Mr. Moore is not your biological father. Mr. Moore, you are 100% certain that these are your daughters and the DNA test will prove. Here comes Mr. Moore, confident as a cat in a sunbeam, declaring he's the biological dad with no room for doubt. He's betting all his chips that the DNA test will back him up. Let's see how his gamble plays out, as the truth serum, aka DNA results, is just around the corner. Ms. Willis, you admit you intended to take this secret to your grave and came clean to your daughter only because your sister forced you to admit the truth. Is that yes, true? Yana. Ms. Willis steps up with a truth bomb of her own. She planned to take this juicy secret to the grave, but got outplayed by her sister's guilt trip. Let's find out what's next in this family saga as secrets start to unravel faster than a cheap sweater. So how has your mother's revelation affected you? Well, it affected me in a lot of different ways, you know, finding out that apparently my father is not my father. Take me back, when did, when did well, you? Well, when I, I was a teenager, about eight, um, we was at my Auntie Miriam's house, the one that's here today. Brace yourselves for a tearjerker moment. Monica spills the beans on how this whole revelation has tossed her world upside down. Discovering that her dad may not be her biological father has stirred up more drama than a reality TV show. Buckle up as we dive deeper into this emotional roller coaster. I went and asked her about it and she was like, no, at first, and then she was like, yeah, you know, he ain't your father. He ain't your sister father as well. So up until that point, this is the man you believed is your father. He's the only man I ever knew. So it was kind of hurtful, you know, to go to him about the situation, because he is a good father. He always been around, I always knew him to be my father. Things are heating up. Monica confronts her mother right in the courtroom, demanding the truth amidst a sea of betrayal. The tension could cut through steel. Stick around because you won't want to miss the reaction when family secrets are aired out like dirty laundry. If, if they would have brought me here, I wouldn't be here at all. But the truth should set you free. <laughs> Take me back. You had the affair. Mm -hmm. You realized you were pregnant. The timing didn't match up. The months didn't match up. So I knew that he couldn't, couldn't be here. So when you did the math, you counted back of when Monica was conceived, you knew that was during the time when you had the affair. Right. But you always told Mr. Moore he was the biological father. All, all the time. All three of them. In a heartfelt testimony, Mr. Moore recounts his active involvement from day one, including cutting the umbilical cord. He's not just a father figure, he's father of the year in his eyes. But don't go anywhere. The DNA results are up next, and they might just rewrite the family history books. No. And so you told him he was the biological father? Yeah. You were present for the birth, Mr. Moore? Yeah. Cut the umbilical cord. You did? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever tell the other man you were pregnant and it possibly could be his child? No. So he does not know? No. Nope. I don't. We have a beautiful he don't, daughter. He don't know. 31 he years don't. later, no, he don't know. Never knew. He don't have a right to so, know she exists. Whew, now that's hurtful. To hear that, Monica. Yeah, it's hurtful because... Just when you think you've heard it all, Aunt Marion waltzes into court to stir the pot even more. She confirms his spilling the paternal beans to Monica and Shalwanda, setting off fireworks in the family. Fasten your seatbelts because this family reunion is about to get bumpier. That you were the person that told Monica and Shawanda, Mr. Moore is not their biological father. They came and asked me, did I know? And I told them, yeah, I know who your daddy is. Really, you know? Should have told them a long time ago. I thought it would maybe be her place to tell them. You'd have shut your mouth, it still would be my place. Well, anyway, I told them. Do you know who Monica's father is? Yeah. It's a friend. Yeah. Grab your popcorn, because here comes the main event. The DNA results are in, and the verdict drops like a bomb. Mr. Moore is not Monica's father. Despite this, Mr. Moore reassures her of his unending fatherly love. The emotional aftershocks are about to hit, so stay tuned. In the case of Moore, Moore versus Willis. When it comes to 31-year-old Monica Moore, it has been determined by this court, Mr. Moore, you are not her father. That's okay. I'm still the dad. The DNA test reveals Mr. Moore is. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Moore, you are her father. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
sweet. The courtroom drama kicks off with a friendly hello from the judge. The judge greets the parties involved in the case, Hernandez versus Hernandez. The judge is introduced and welcomes everyone to the courtroom, setting a formal yet courteous tone for the proceedings. You can almost feel the anticipation in the air as everyone settles in for what promises to be a roller coaster of emotions. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of Hernandez versus Hernandez. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Hey. Ms. Hernandez, four years ago, you met and then married your much younger but seemingly perfect man. You say your estranged husband started denying you and your now three-year-old daughter, Liana. Right out of the gate, Ms. Hernandez drops a bombshell about her younger estranged husband. Ms. Hernandez claims her estranged husband began denying her and their three-year-old daughter, Ligana, after he found a younger woman. She emotionally describes the impact of his denial on both her and her daughter, highlighting the child's attachment to her father. It's like a soap opera, but with legal documents and less dramatic pauses. After he found another younger woman, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Hernandez, you claim that during the marriage you often spent weeks at a time on a fishing boat for work, only to find out upon returning home that your wife had other men in and out of your house while you were at sea. Mr. Hernandez isn't buying any of it, and he's ready to set the record straight. Mr. Hernandez counters by asserting that he spent long periods away for work and discovered upon return that his wife was unfaithful. He expresses his doubts about being Lagana's biological father, driven by his belief in his wife's infidelity and a desire to prove his non-paternity. The plot thickens, and you can't help but wonder what's going to be revealed next. You and your girlfriend are here to prove Liana is not yours, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, so Ms. Hernandez, how was your husband's denial affecting you and your daughter? It's hard for me to put my daughter down to sleep. All she does is says, da, 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 all day. How old is she? She's three, she'll be four three. in December. The judge dives deeper, asking about little Ligana. Judge Lake inquires about the age of the child, Ligana, who is nearing four years old, emphasizing the child's awareness and emotional needs. This moment stresses the child's understanding of her situation, particularly her repeated calls for her father. It's like a tiny heart hugging at the strings of the courtroom. You believe is his, her biological father is denying her? Yes. And so what are you telling her? I don't know what to tell her, Your Honor. Do you know that this young child is calling out for you, Mr. Hernandez? Oh, Your Honor. But you do not believe this is your biological child? Yes, Your Honor. Look at her. Look at your three-year-old daughter. She haven't been there in three years. All right, so pretty much this child is being at least emotionally abandoned. There's some yeah. need that she's calling out for and she's getting no response. Yes, Your Honor. Then comes a twist worthy of a daytime Emmy. A family member reportedly told Mr. Hernandez that Ms. Hernandez's ex was seen in their bed. This revelation fuels Mr. Hernandez's doubts about his paternity, linking directly to his distress and the trust issues within the marriage. And just like that, the courtroom turns into a scene straight out of a telenovela. Someone told you her ex was in your bed? Yes. While you're out fishing? Yes. Who told you that? A family member. How would they know who I had in my bed? <laughs> they seen him. Yeah, coming out of the house because you and him are friends. That's not you him. You know that he was at my house it even is not when him. you were I'm there not too. talking about him. So now you believe that he is Liana's biological father because yes, you Liana. believe Miss Hernandez was sleeping with her ex while you were out on this fishing boat. Yes. The mystery deepens with the saga of the birth certificate. The judge notes that the child's birth certificate does not bear Mr. Hernandez's surname, a point of contention that raises questions about the paternity and Ms. Hernandez's intentions at the time of birth. This detail underlines the ongoing suspicion and lack of trust between the couple. Everyone's on the edge of their seats, waiting to see how this document drama unfolds. What is interesting to me is in the court records, we have the birth certificate, and on the birth certificate, Liana does not have Mr. Hernandez's last name. No, she does not. I when I that. was in the hospital after I had her, he wanted me to name her his last name. I didn't want to. Just in case something like this happened, it, like he denied her. <laughs> there you go. Now that's a first. You didn't give your child her father's last name. Mr. Hernandez has his own version of events, and he's not shy about sharing. Mr. Hernandez explains his resistance to sign the birth certificate with his surname because of his doubts, compounded by the alleged comments from Ms. Hernandez's family members at the hospital. This interaction highlights the depth of his uncertainty and the complex family dynamics influencing the case. The courtroom feels more like a reality TV show set at this point. I wanted to sign that birth certificate because I wanted her to have my last name, and now you tell him, well, you shouldn't have signed it then. But he's denying her because he has doubt. How do you know it's not true? Did they deny it? Did you confront them and they deny it? I didn't it? know who, who it was. Was. But he if you don't know who it was, how do you know it didn't happen? I don't know why he's denying her because she looks exactly like him when he was when she was a baby, and now she looks like me. 
In what feels like a climactic scene, the topic of parental rights comes to a head. In a heated exchange, Ms. Hernandez asks Mr. Hernandez to sign over his parental rights, revealing the extent of their estrangement and conflicting desires regarding the child's future. The tension underscores the emotional and legal complexities facing the family. Hold on to your hats because this legal rodeo is just getting started. She calls me and tells me to sign over the rights. No, I asked you. Full name to her. Child is calling out for her daddy and you say this is her daddy, but you're calling him and telling him to sign over his right. Yeah, because he, he, he has... And the text message. He has, he has okay. not supported his daughter or done anything to be in her life since... Then how what, come like, my... But he's on the birth certificate. Yes. He's so on he is the legal father. Yeah. yeah. You can get state order child support. Uh, he's on child support since February. And bam, the truth is out. Mr. Hernandez, you are the father. Told you. <laughs> I can see that made you emotional. Do you feel a level of remorse and regret because he yes. much missed three years of her life? Yes. The courtroom drama kicks off with Mr. Hunter dropping a bombshell. He's pretty convinced that Ms. Holden is pointing fingers at him as the daddy just because he's been opening his wallet a bit too often. Stick around because Ms. Holden's clapback is just around the corner. Mr. Hunter, you opened your case in paternity court because you say there is no way you fathered the defendant's son, Josiah. You worry she's only saying you did because of the financial security you provide for her. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Here comes Ms. Holden, stepping into the spotlight with a twist in her tail. She's been tossed some wonky medical advice, but now puts her chips all in, betting that Mr. Hunter is indeed the papa bear. Mr. Hunter's not buying it, though. Up next, he spills wide. Ms. Holden, you admit you were confused about your son's biological father because you were given incorrect medical information, but you are 100% certain Mr. Hunter is the father. Mr. Hunter lays it all out, showing he's not just here to play games. He's been Mr. Moneybags, covering everything from baby formula to those adorable tiny sneakers. But hang tight, his money moves have got more to the story. So you pretty much stepped up as a father. Yes, ma'am. You have, but you have doubt. Yes, ma'am. But Miss Holden, has he gotten emotionally attached to Josiah as well? Yes. So he pretty much has accepted this child as his own? Yes, Your Honor. Just when you thought it was all about the money, there's a twist of emotions. Ms. Holden testifies to Mr. Hunter's emotional ties with little Josiah, despite the swirling paternity doubts. What's coming up will tug at your heartstrings and maybe even your funny bone. You all are in a relationship. Yes. What kind of relationship? Boyfriend and girlfriend. You boyfriend and girlfriend. Yes, so take me back to how this relationship started because I'm trying to understand how a you all are boyfriend and girlfriend, but you have doubts about the paternity, but you still accept and love and are attached to this baby like it's your own. Yes. Rewind to the start of this soap opera. Our lovebirds recount the fateful party that spun their friendly neighbor vibes into a full-blown romance, all kicked off by a birthday bash. But hold your horses. The tale takes a turn when booze and bad decisions enter the mix. We lived on the same street. Uh, I met him when I was 15. We both was in a relationship, then we both became single. I invited him over to my birthday party, and he offered to pay for the booth at the party and offered to buy the cake. Well, that was a nice gesture for a friend, Mr. Hunter. Yes, ma'am. Did you have any benefits in the back of your mind that you were looking to get later? No, ma'am. As if the plot couldn't thicken anymore, here we dive into the murky waters of their relationship's beginnings. Were they cautious lovebirds or reckless romantics? Their memory seems as patchy as a bad internet connection. Up next, Ms. Holden drops a truth bomb that's a real doozy. Yeah, but that And night, one thing led to another. That night, we didn't sleep. Yes, we did, Your Honor. Okay, so on the birthday night, you said you did have sex. And Mr. Hunter, you say you did not. Yeah, we did that night. Yes, we did, Your Honor. I'm not gonna say, I was like, well, let's move forward. So at some point, you all decided to date. Yes. yes. And you decide to continue on with a sexual relation. Yes. Yeah. So were you having sex with protection? No. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. The plot thickens, and so does the tension. Ms. Holden admits to playing the field, sans protection, adding layers to the paternity puzzle. Brace yourselves. Her next revelation is a game changer. You all haven't agreed on one thing yet. Who said yes? She said no. I said yes, we were using protection. No, we wasn't. Okay. You're having sex. One says you're using protection, one says you're not. Are you having sex with anybody else? Is this a committed relationship, or did you all fall into a sexual relationship without any foundation of a commitment? 
We were just friends. Hold on to your hats, folks, because the pregnancy plot twist is a real roller coaster. Amidst a flurry of mixed signals and sleepy confessions, Ms. Holden breaks the news to Mr. Hunter, who's got feelings about it. What happens next? You guessed it. It gets even messier. I called him over, and he came over, and I was so sleepy, and he was like, you must be pregnant, because I'm sick. He was telling me he was sick, and I was like, yes. And then he was like, oh, you just broke my heart. And then I was like, well, I'm sorry. Why did it break your heart that she was pregnant? I didn't want to have no more kids because I have kids. Just when you think it couldn't get more convoluted, it does. Ms. Holden explains the name game debacle with changing due dates that would baffle even a seasoned mathematician. Fasten your seatbelts. The hospital saga is up next, and it's a bumpy ride. Ms. Holden, did you know Mr. Hunter had doubts all this time? Yes. Did you invite him to the hospital for the birth? No, ma'am. You didn't? No, ma'am. This is confusing. Now, you're paying for everything, but you don't want to get attached because of your previous paternity situation. Right. But you're accepting his support, right, Ms. Holden? Yes, But you don't invite him to the hospital? No, he I, dropped me off. I didn't want to come anyway. I, I mean... <laughs> Imagine this. Mr. Hunter, the potential dad, makes a hospital run, but opts out of the delivery room drama. He's got his reasons, tangled in a web of past paternity perplexities. But wait, there's more chaos to come with the birth certificate revelation. The baby that could be yours, Right. But you didn't go upstairs no. to participate? No. no. Did you put Mr. Hunter's name on the birth certificate, Ms. Holden? No, Your Honor. Did anybody bring a copy of that birth certificate? I have uh, I'd like to see that. Jerome, hand me that evidence, please. This is Josiah's birth certificate? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Hunter, is that your last name under... No, no ma'am. Whose last name is that, Ms. Holden? The other guy. The other guy. And now, the moment of truth or confusion. The birth certificate doesn't feature Mr. Hunter's name, but another contender in this daddy dilemma. The plot thickens, and trust me, you'll want to see Mr. Hunter's reaction to this soap opera twist. Jerome, hand me that evidence. Sure. May I explain to you? Yes, please explain to me, yeah. Ms. Holt. You brought a calendar. Yes, ma'am. Step up to the calendar, please. In November the 15th, this is when I slept with Mr. Hunter. I went to the doctor. My first due date they gave me was August 2nd. Okay. And then I went back to the doctor and they gave me August 9th. And I slept with the other man on the 18th of November. Grab your tissues, because the feels are getting real. Mr. Hunter shares his heartfelt bond with the child, now calling him Dada, which stirs up all the daddy feels. But hold on, Ms. Holden is about to share something that will crank up the emotional dial. Now, Mr. Hunter, when you heard her explain that story, did you feel more convinced that Josiah was yours? No, young. I feel like it's more of a financial than, than anything, because you got the dates all, they're all mixed up. With Josiah coming three weeks early, two different men, three days apart, unprotected, it's called a window of conception for a reason. And so you're still within the window. Okay. You in the window of doubt and in the window of confusion. DNA test time, drum roll please. Mr. Hunter, you are not. <laughs> so very sorry. Sorry. Mr. Hunter, I can see that hurt, and that's not the news I wanted to deliver today. I must still be in his life. The courtroom kicks off with a bang. Here we go. The case begins with introductions that set the scene for a paternity squabble involving Ms. Hardin and Mr. Nelson over their two-month-old Sophia Nelson. Ms. Hardin steps up, hoping to patch things up with Mr. Nelson, who's in total denial about being Sophia's dad. She's hoping to twist his arm, figuratively of course, into helping raise their daughter. Stay tuned, because Mr. Nelson's got a real zinger coming up. Ms. Hardin, you have opened your case today in hopes of saving your relationship with the defendant. You say, due to a misunderstanding understanding he is now denying your two-month-old daughter Sophia Nelson. You are certain is the father and once proven you want his help raising your daughter. Mr. Nelson drops a bombshell. He's 1000% sure he's not the dad and claims he's got the real dad's name in his back pocket. Meanwhile, Ms. Hardin shares her struggles, painting a picture of Mr. Nelson as the ghost dad who won't even touch a diaper. It's like he thinks baby stuff is lava. What's next? The judge dives into their backstory and you won't believe what comes out. You refuse to lift a finger for a child that isn't yours. You say you are 1,000% certain you are not Sophia's biological father and claim that you know who is. Delonte doesn't help me with anything. He doesn't help me financially. He won't pick up a diaper. He won't watch her for 15 minutes while I go through it. When she cry, he'd be like, hey, get your daughter. Your daughter crying. Your daughter wants you. Get her, get her. He don't help me at all. Dive deeper into soap opera territory here. The judge starts digging into how Ms. Harden and Mr. Nelson's roller coaster started in Louisiana 
and made a pit stop in Arkansas. Ms. Hardin shares her tale of emotional baggage and why she followed Mr. Nelson despite many red flags. Buckle up because Ms. Hardin is about to spill some real emotional tea. I met her when I went down to Louisiana with my family. I thought she was cool. Uh, she wanted to move with me to Arkansas. Um, Wait a minute, how, how did we get there? Right. No, that is not. No. Yes, it is. So how did it happen, Ms. Hardin? No, when he came down to visit with his family members, we became friends first, and then when it was time for him to go back to Louisiana with his family, do you want to no, come with no, me no, or no, do you want to stay? I, no, I... How long I was he come... there? He was there for a couple of months. Tissues out, folks. Ms. Hardin gets real about her loneliness and how Mr. Nelson seemed like a beacon of hope despite not being the kid type. She hoped their baby might cement their shaky relationship. Emotional much? Just wait till you hear about the delivery room drama. That's all right. We come here to tell the truth. And if that's your truth, you say it. Yes, ma'am. So you were feeling alone in the world. Yes. Yeah, and I never really had nobody in my life talk to me. Nobody, they would like talk, but they wouldn't listen to where I was coming from. They didn't listen to what I had to say. And he, he was there for me and I, I gravitated towards it. Hospital room showdown. The birth of Sophia only cranks up the tension as Mr. Nelson questions the baby's paternity right off the bat based on her looks and storms out of the hospital. If you thought that was intense, just wait until Mr. Nelson pulls out his exhibit of doubt. It was semi there, I call it. Lisa when I started, there. Lot of, my, lot of, okay, lot of, but that don't count, that don't count. He watched her be pushed out. He waited for my daughter to be weighed and wiped off and he walked, he told me that's a white man's baby and walked out of the hospital room. What? She came out like really like. That's like how she, she came out. She didn't look like that. She been in the womb. Come on, I'm, I'm black though. Here comes the conspiracy theory. Mr. Nelson lays out his case with a tale of suspicious exes crashing at their place, complete with texts that could rival any daytime drama. He's convinced the texts between Ms. Harden and her ex are more than friendly. Strap in, because we're about to bring Mr. Patterson into the mix and the plot's about to thicken. And you've brought an exhibit to outline that doubt, am I correct? You don't Please no step up to the monitor. It all started, we went back to Arkansas, got our own place together. Around that time, her ex-boyfriend John and his baby mother, which is Rachel at the time didn't have nowhere to go so they wanted to come stay with us but that being her ex-boyfriend I thought it was disrespectful I said no she still went along with it anyway and I found that suspicious was your ex and y'all had relations why would you want to be under the same roof as him with me enter the ex Mr. Patterson hits the stand denying all baby daddy allegations but the tension's so thick you could cut it with a knife as accusations fly the courtroom turns into a pressure cooker of he said she said think it can't get more twisted wait until Rachel steps up and adds her two cents eventually they left I came back everything was cool I thought you know everything's fine I was you know suspecting none because I had no proof until I went through her phone and I found text messages of John texting her hey baby you want some more how you doing this what and that. yeah you yeah. want some more she denied it three weeks later find out she pregnant and then three weeks after that I went to the doctor the doctor said she was two months pregnant just when you thought it was a wrap, Rachel throws a curveball into the mix. She testifies about jealousy, miscommunications, and a hubby who might just be stirring the pot for kicks. The web of intrigue just keeps growing. Hold on to your hats because the DNA results are up next, and they're about to drop some truth bombs. The back and forth calls with Pinky. Pinky's called me a week and a half ago, telling me that John was obsessed with the fact of thinking that her kid is his. Trying, I guess trying to make me jealous. As me and John got in an argument one time, and then he was being petty, and he was like, ha ha, the baby is mine. He told me that. But he, but we were arguing. We were arguing about oh, yeah. but I lies after you lies. Shot, though, of him but she, you would tell me one thing and tell Delonte something different no, he every knew time. He has a Drum roll, please. The DNA results are in. And guess what? It has been determined by this court. The biological father is Mr. Nelson. You are the biological father. The courtroom is buzzing with anticipation as the session begins. The judge coolly calls everyone to settle down, throwing in a cheeky welcome. Jerome, the court officer, steps up to announce the case of Cohen versus Cohen, all about a spicy paternity dispute. The crowd and participants share a lively exchange of greetings. Buckle up, this is just the warm up. Please be seated. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is the case of Cohen versus Cohen. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Mrs. Cohen, you have opened your case to prove to your husband that he is the father of your one-year-old son, Kyrie. You say your marriage is on the verge of divorce. Mrs. Cohen steps up to the plate, ready to swing at the paternity pitch. She passionately opens her case, determined to prove Mr. Cohen is the father of Kyrie, their one-year-old son. She's convinced that his denial is driving their marriage straight toward divorce cliff. Mr. Cohen counters, accusing Mrs. Cohen of bringing another player into their home field. Things are heating up. Let's see where this emotional roller coaster takes us. Mr. Cohen, you say your wife brought another man into your home and had sex with him under your roof. Yes, you claim your trust has been shattered and you're enduring the 
ultimate betrayal of not knowing whether or not Kyrie is your son. Mrs. Cohen is all about saving the sinking ship that is their marriage. She's on a mission, folks, asserting her faithfulness. She's desperate to prove the paternity of their son, recounting their love story that started way back in high school. Mr. Cohen, however, is wallowing in the shattered remains of his trust, deeply pained by the swirling paternity doubts. Drama alert. The stakes are as high as the emotions. What is the current status of your marriage? Right now, I'm trying to save my marriage because we are on the verge of divorce. I want to prove to him that he is the father of our one-year-old son. He's my high school sweetheart. We met in the 10th grade. The judge digs deeper, turning the spotlight on their rocky relationship. She probes about the current rocky state of their union. Mrs. Cohen sees a glimmer of hope for reconciliation, despite their looming divorce. She shares the deep cuts from Mr. Cohen's accusations, feeling unpretty after baby duty. Next up, we've got more juicy details that you won't want to miss. And I just really want to prove to him and his family members that he is the father of our one-year-old son. What are you feeling right now? I'm just hurt a lot because he makes it seem like I'm just the only one that's out here cheating when he's the one cheating too. Like, he made me feel like less of a woman when I had our um, one-year-old son. Mr. Cohen takes the emotional stage, spilling the beans on their tumultuous love saga. He candidly shares how both parties contributed to their love's demolition derby, his paternity doubts casting a long shadow over his heart. He confesses his early reluctance in his roles as husband and father, which only tossed more grenades into the fray. Don't go anywhere. The tea keeps spilling. Mr. Cohen, you hear your wife is saying that you all have both pretty much destroyed the relationship together, but now this paternity question is taking it over the top. I see tears in your eyes. Yes, sure. It matters to you. Yes. What are you feeling? I'm just really hurt right now that we had to come this far to get these answers. Secrets spill as Mr. Cohen reveals his late night sleuthing adventure. He admits to using Mrs. Cohen's sleeping fingerprint to unlock her phone, diving deep into her digital world. His discovery of a mysterious note with names, including a stranger, cranks up his doubts to 11. Strap in folks, this emotional thrill ride takes another wild turn just ahead. Mr. Cohen, how did you find out your wife was cheating? I went through Jasmine's phone one day after we got back together. Her phone was locked. She had a passcode on it. I used all Jasmine's 10 fingers on her finger to unlock her iPhone. She had a lock on her phone with her finger. With her right, um, so how did you use her finger? She was asleep at the time, and I put the, her finger on the phone, and she continued to stay asleep. As the plot thickens, Mrs. Cohen's pregnancy timeline comes under the microscope, matching up suspiciously with their break. She confesses to a rendezvous with another man during their time apart, defending her actions as payback for Mr. Cohen's own escapades. The plot's as tangled as a bowl of spaghetti. Let's see how they try to untangle this mess in the next clip. I went to Instagram, I typed in the guy's name and apparent his name popped up first. I clicked on that picture and I- How do you know it was the guy? I actually, I went into his DMs and I, I was like, you're having a baby, sir. And he replied back to me, acting like he knew exactly who I was. No, I only slept with her one time and that's not my child, her being pregnant or anything. And then he blocked me, sir. Fair, I was already pregnant when I slept with him. Enter the medical expert throwing a curveball into the mix. He steps up to unpack Mr. Cohen's diabetes and its potential impact on his swimmers. Despite the health hiccup, the expert clarifies that Mr. Cohen's fathering odds, though slimmed down, aren't out for the count. The tension's building. Will science tip the scales in this paternity puzzle? Stick around, the big reveal is up next. I have um, type two diabetes. I didn't have no insurance at the time, so it was uncontrolled, meaning my sugars were always high. So every time I would eject, my semen would become weird and it wouldn't, it can't travel right. It, it... So how do I get pregnant, Quarry? Well, I was about to say, you all do have another child together, right? Yes, Your Honor. I didn't have diabetes at the time. It's D-Day as the DNA results are finally unveiled. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Cohen, you are the father. <laughs> oh my God. Everybody's a father. Ms. Cousin steps up to the plate, swinging with allegations that Mr. Bell, the defendant, denies being the papa of her seven-month-old munchkin, Taquan, and has even ghosted her and her mom. They both nod vigorously to Judge Lake in agreement. Strap in, folks. It's just getting juicy. Ms. Cousin, you and your mother say you had no choice but to drag the defendant, Mr. Bell, into court today because you're fed up with his lie. Yes, she He won't. denies being the father of your seven-month-old son, Taquan, and has even gone to the extreme by blocking all contact with you. Mr. Bell comes 
comes back with a curveball, countering Ms. Cousin's heavy accusations by claiming she's previously told him he's not the father of Taquan. He suggests she's using the baby drama to throw a wrench in his six-year relationship with another woman. The plot thickens. Don't go anywhere. That Miss Cousin has told you that you are not Juan's father and say she's trying to use this baby to bust up your six-year relationship. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. You're confident that today's DNA results will get her out of your life for good. Yes, Your Honor. Miss Cousin, you say you're fed up with his lies. Fed up with his lies because he a two-time liar. Oh, snap. Did she just say that? Ms. Cousin's mother, Sharonica, jumps into the fray, calling Mr. Bell a two-timing fibber for misleading her daughter about being single, revealing her detective work involved snooping through photos on another woman's phone. Buckle up. Roller coaster is heading to a loop. I seen how her attitude changed. Who did I no, sleep I with? You or her? I knew then that she was pregnant. Who did I you know, sleep with? You or I her? I met you. I met you at a relative house. You came to a relative house to you pick up what's your child one doing, weekend hold on. with her Mr. bad Mr. Bell, hold on. And you took her with you. You had your cousin in the car. You got out the car. You greet me things are heating up. During a fiery exchange, Mr. Bell and Ms. Cousin's mother argue over who he truly had an affair while Judge Lake tries to keep the peace and get to the bottom of this lover's quarrel. Keep your eyes peeled. It's about to get even wilder. She got in the car with you. She left with you for that whole weekend. Ms. Cousin, you're basically saying that Mr. Bell was a two-timer. He had your daughter thinking he was in a relationship with her, but he was really in a relationship with somebody else? Yes, Your Honor. Is that true, Mr. Bell? We went out once, but that was it. A whole weekend? No. I had to get back to her. You went not once, a whole weekend, yeah. And then not only that, y'all had can lunch she, together she let her work. daughter talk? I she wasn't her there? Room. Wait, there's more. Sharonica dishes out more dirt, explaining she found receipts for two lunch combos in her daughter's room, hinting that Mr. Bell and her daughter were more than just work buddies. Mr. Bell just shrugs it off. Oh, the drama. Stay tuned for the next scene. I go in her room, I found receipts with two combos on it. I asked her what a combo's for. She, for him and her. Two combos of uh, Meal for lunch. Uh-huh, oh yeah. Oh, so if she's oh, paying, if she Every paying day. for her. Of course I'm gonna take the food. She paying for it. Listen, uh, Destiny, I want to hear man. from you. Let her talk. So, Mr. Bell, first of all, I got this under control. I'm listening to the testimony. I'm gonna get to you. They're the plaintiffs. They're bringing this action, so I want to know why. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Grab your popcorn. This is getting good. Ms. Cousin's mom shares the emotional and financial strain they've endured, supporting Taquan all alone, emphasizing how it's messed with her daughter's life plans. It's a real tearjerker with a side of financial woe. What's next? More bomb shells for sure. And be a man and help take care of his son. Because me and my husband have been doing it for the last buying milk, squalers, walkers, baby bed, car seat, everything. That take a toll on me. Destiny was on a good route. She graduated from job coat high school diploma. I pushed that to the foot because I was not going to let her give up on her education. Once she graduated, job coat gave her a job, somewhere to work. You won't believe this twist. Judge Lake digs deeper into the one night stand Mr. Bell admits to, questioning the logistics and whether protection was part of the equation, which he insists it was. Ms. Cousin disagrees right away. Oh, the anticipation. What will the DNA say? I, I want you to take me back, because I want to hear your side. Now, you say, yeah, you ate the food because she was buying it. You said, yeah, you slept with her once. Nah. It only takes once. You know that, right? No. And so, what was the nature of the relationship in your mind? I only seen her outside maybe twice. We was never together because I had to go home to her. I was staying with her. Were so you flirting with her at work? Yeah. Yes. Seriously, Mr. Bell sticks to his guns, stubbornly denying fatherhood, blaming the rumor mill at work for the baby news. He's all about denying, denying, denying. Classic courtroom drama. But don't wander off. The truth serum, aka DNA results, is up next. Are you denying the baby yes. is yours? Yes. Because you have the girlfriend of six years or because you truly believe this isn't your I biological it's not child? Mine. Why? Why do you doubt? When she got pregnant, I, I found out she was pregnant through a manager at the job. He called me in the office. And I told him the same thing I, I'm telling her. It's not mine. Why are you lying? No way. He didn't just say that. Destiny recounts the one and only time Mr. Bell dropped by to see Taquan, supposedly for a fatherly visit. But instead, he tried to score a hookup. Talk about awkward family visits. The tension is palpable. What will he say to that? He said, would you have sex with me? I was like, no, he's my, what you scared of your boyfriend? I said, I ain't scared of my boyfriend. My boyfriend ain't got nothing to do with it. And when he came, he had a flat tire. He asked to use my sister, um, four-wayer to take the tire off. So my dad was trying to help him. And when he came in to see Taquan, he said, oh, Taquan look like... And I was like, like, well, he looked like you with them crazy mm -hmm. eyes. I told him, I need help with this child because Destiny don't have no money. But he did not do that. He blocked calls and everything. Drum roll, please. The moment of truth arrives as the court reveals the DNA results. It has been determined by this court. Jabelle, you are the father. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You're silent now. The courtroom setting introduces a dramatic scene, kind of like the start of a reality show, but with legal jargon. The episode begins with formal introductions in the courtroom, sort of setting the stage for a legal drama. The case Lewis v. Scott is announced with all the gravity of a blockbuster premiere. The audience and participants greet each other formally, almost as if they're about to start a very polite tea party, but with a judge. Please be seated. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of Lewis v. Scott. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. The tension rises as Mr. Lewis steps up with a claim that could stir up a soap opera plot. He asserts his belief that he is the biological father of Crystal Scott, having been told so by her mother 35 years ago, despite not being present in her life like a character who pops up out of nowhere in season two. Mr. Scott counters this claim by stating his constant presence in Crystal's life since her birth, emphasizing his legal marriage to her mother, basically playing the role of the steadfast day one character. You say for 35 years, you've always known you were Miss Scott's biological father, but circumstances kept you away. You claim the DNA results will prove you are Crystal Scott's dad. You claim you are Crystal's biological father. You were at her birth, raised her from day one, and are still legally married to her mother. The courtroom listens intently as Crystal shares what sounds like a nostalgic episode from a family sitcom. Judge Lake questions Crystal about her knowledge of her paternity, turning the courtroom into a scene of a family drama series. Crystal reveals that she grew up believing Mr. Scott was her biological father, as her mother never indicated otherwise. She shares fond memories of their life together, making it sound like a highlight reel of a family vacation. Were you told as a child that Mr. Lewis was your biological father? Your Honor, my mom never told me that Mr. Lewis was my biological father. My dad here, he raised me, he taught me how to fish. We went on a uh, family vacation. That's one we were in Florida. Just last year, we were there for a family reunion, well, class reunion. He he taught me what to expect from a man, hardworking. This was your dad. Mm -hmm. Amidst a quiet courtroom, Mr. Lewis recounts a hidden truth that feels like a plot twist in a novella. He details his long-term affair with Ms. Mother, acknowledging that it occurred while she was married to Mr. Scott. He describes the moment he was informed by Ms. Swaxit's mother that Crystal was his child, which he believed due to the trust he had in her, narrating it as if it's the climactic point of a love triangle. You had with Ms. Scott's mother. Well. Ms. Scott and I had met, and we uh, got into a relationship. We both, uh, I was in love with her, and I believed she was in love with me. I was an unhappy man, she was an unhappy wife. So you knew she so was married? I knew she was married. And you said you were an unhappy man. I was unhappy. Were, were you an unhappy man or an unhappy husband? I was an unhappy husband. As Crystal speaks, the courtroom is enveloped in suspense, almost like the audience waiting for the next episode's teaser. Crystal recounts early childhood memories of meeting Mr. Lewis during outings with her mother, describing subtle interactions that hinted at a special connection between her mother and Mr. Lewis, though she was told he was just a friend. It's like she's recounting episodes from a mysterious kids show where the adults are always up to something. When's the first time you remember meeting Mr. Lewis? When I was little, I used to be up under my mom's tail all the time. Everywhere she went, I had to go. Five years old, six years old, when she would say, let's go to the store, that's when we would go and meet Mr. Lewis in the store. When we would meet him, he would give me five, ten dollars. They would walk a little bit down the aisle, you know, and hug, kiss. And you I, saw your mother hug mm -hmm, and, and kiss I would Mr. Just Lewis. Be... Who did your mother tell you this man was? She just told me he was a friend. Crystal's confession brings a hush over the audience, like a dramatic pause in a season finale. The emotional weight of the situation is palpable as Crystal discusses the impact of her mother's recent admission of Mr. Lewis possibly being her father, leading to a deep internal conflict given her lifelong belief that Mr. Scott was her dad. It's like a moment from a coming-of-age film where the protagonist discovers a family secret. So this is a 35 year old mystery and now you have to look at the man who you've believed all your life is your biological father and now you have to have very real questions because your mother has finally after 35 years validated those questions and it hurts to think that he could not be my father. Because you say he's your hero. He is. The judge probes deeper into the reasons behind Mr. Lewis's decisions, making it feel like an intense cross-examination scene from a legal drama. The judge inquires why Mr. Lewis did not pursue a relationship with Crystal, despite knowing he could be her father. Mr. Lewis explains his decision to stay away to avoid potential violent conflicts and legal issues, reflecting on the personal and relational complexities involved, adding layers to his character like a troubled anti-hero. Once she told you definitively, this is your daughter, then where are you in this? Why are you not pursuing it? Why not that extra step? We broke up, but that is, that is true. And I, and I thought about all those things that you're seeing right there. But then I also thought about the harm it would do. 
what what it's gonna be, what's gonna come after that, you know? Are we, are him and I are gonna cut, get into it? Want us to go to graveyard, want us to go to prison. Everyone holds their breath as the DNA results are revealed, turning the courtroom into a suspense thriller scene. The biological father is Mr. Lewis. You may be seated, says the judge, setting the stage for a courtroom showdown in the case of Walker vs. Royal. Grab your popcorn, folks. This is going to be good. You may be seated. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is the case of Walker vs. Royale. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Cue the dramatic music. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. Mrs. Walker steps up with a story that sounds straight out of a soap opera about her late son, Delante, and his entangled paternity saga. You say before your son, Delante's tragic death, he had doubts that he had fathered the defendant's one-year-old son, Delante Royal. Brace yourselves. Ms. Walker lays it all out. She's here for the DNA results to find out if she can officially call her son Delante's child her grandson. It's like the Maury show, but with more legalese. You claim you need today's DNA results so you can embrace this child as your grandson. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. I'm very sorry for your loss. Ms. Royal fires back with confidence, claiming she's 100% sure Delante Sr. is the daddy. The courtroom's heating up, and we're here for the tea. You claim that you are 100% positive that Ms. Walker's deceased son is the biological father of your child, and today's results will prove paternity. Here comes a heart wrencher. Ms. Walker talks about her son's tragic end and the lingering doubts he left behind about his little one's paternity. Pass the tissues, please. My son left something behind with me, and that was his doubt. And I am here today to get the doubt taken care of. Her child, her son, I don't know if that's my grandchild or not. And it, it hurts, so I would love to embrace that child. And I can tell. Yeah. I can see the tears in your eyes. Yes. That doubt is really eating away at you. Me and my family, we love her son. We, lo we love him. But we just can't go all the way. We can't be 100% because we just don't know. And the plot thickens. The pain of not knowing if the child is her grandson is clearly weighing on Ms. Walker, tearing at the heartstrings of everyone in the room. Stay tuned because this emotional roller coaster isn't slowing down. Yeah. And we want to say he left a son. Right. But you said he left his doubt. He left his doubt. With you. Yes. And that is very hard for you to carry that. It is. It's weighing on my shoulders, Your Honor. I have nothing but love. I want nothing but love to give to that child. But I can't give it. The judge sees right through the tears. She acknowledges Ms. Walker's pain, emphasizing just how much these DNA results mean to the family. Just when you think it couldn't get more intense, it does. So, Ms. Royal. You hear Ms. Walker express the fact that Delante, her deceased son, left behind doubt. You don't think there's any reason to doubt? The reason why I say that, I have been completely loyal to him. I have, there's no other person that can say, this may be my child. Flashback to a dramatic morning. Ms. Walker recalls a big blowout over suspicious texts which fueled Delante's doubts even further. The courtroom is more gripping than my last binge watch. I am 100% sure that this is Delante's son. I remember one day, to fuel his doubts, they got in an argument. He seen text messages between her and a guy around the time when she conceived. And so he had doubts. So tell me what happened that day. So I go in there, I'm like, what's going on? You know, mom, she's a, a H, she's this, she's that. She, she's about three months pregnant at this time. Cause she's here text messages between her and this guy around the time she got pregnant. The intrigue continues. We dive into a past argument full of jealousy and accusations, making everyone second guess what's true. Who needs reality TV when you have real-life courtroom drama. Ms. Royal defends her honor against the cheating claims, describing her own investigation into Delante's late-night antics. The drama, the intrigue, it's better than a detective series. When he came in the house, I started going through his phone, which I didn't find anything. So after that, he caught me. Yes, he did. He said, if you think I'm cheating, you can get your stuff and leave. Well, I was trying to get my stuff and leave. I got my phone. He grabbed my phone to see who I was calling. It was an older dude. He, I called him my brother. He just a person I looked up to also. I let him go through the messages. He called me shorty. I had no problem with him calling me that because I don't, that's not nothing to me. I call this boy my brother. He's an older person. Here's a scene straight from a movie. The birth of the baby filled with joy, tears, and a whispered request for a DNA test. Talk about an emotional bombshell. We're all in there. We're all happy. It was her, her family members. He embraced that child. He kissed the baby on the forehead and everything. She asked him, she said, um, Delonte, do you want a A test now? Right in the hospital. Uh, he laid his head on my shoulder. He said, first he said, mom, I think I'm gonna throw up. Oh. When he seen the baby. She asked him, did he want a DNA test? Seen her family members, he told her, no. Later on that day, he looked at me and mom said, yes, I need a DNA test. Oh. 
Just when you thought it was all resolved, Delante drops a bomb by admitting he still has doubts. This isn't just a paternity case, it's a saga. So, Miss Royal, did you know that he had gone to his mother and said, I really need no, a you, test? No, Your Honor, because I asked him twice. I didn't care about the doubt. So it's your testimony. The reason why I kept asking him, do you want one and do you want one, is because I knew it was his yeah, child. I just know. And so if you want one, let's get it so let's we can get it, get it done. You know, why we, he didn't sign a birth certificate, Your Honor? <laughs> he didn't sign it because he didn't have his ID. When we kept telling him he was being irresponsible. He, that was not my fault. Plot twist. The debate over why Delante didn't sign the birth certificate throws another curveball into the mix. This episode just keeps delivering shocks. He would have signed that birth certificate oh, yes. if he had yes. brought his ID? Yes, Your Honor, I believe. You I just believe. thought he was being irresponsible yes. and he just forgot it. It was so much going on. Yes. When she she stated that she was pregnant. For this baby to have your last name, you have to have an ID to sign the birth certificate to give that baby your last name. She was probably two, three, four months. So he had months time, not the butt time, to get this ID. In a tear-jerking moment, we learn Delante passed away just three weeks after his son was born. The stakes are higher than ever as we wait for the DNA results to reveal the truth. Did your son unfortunately pass away? Three weeks. Oh. Three weeks. Oh, I'm so sorry. So three weeks later. Yes, three weeks later, Your Honor. I, I drawn to him and, and Ladybug, because that's all I had left, you know. He was my oldest child, you know, He was, but he was still my baby. So I needed that comfort. So you say her. you were drawn to Ms. Royal. Yes. The moment of truth arrives with the DNA results. The percentage of relatedness between Ms. Monique Walker and Delante Royal is 99.99% no! yes! period you yes! are really period, period. <laughs> The courtroom buzzes to life as the case of Brock versus Almanza is introduced, setting the stage for some serious daytime drama over paternity and possible cheating shenanigans. Hello, Your Honor. This is a case of Brock versus Almanza. Thank you. You're welcome. Good day, everyone. Mr. Brock, you claim you have been supporting Ms. Almanza's two children for the last five years. Mr. Brock lays it all on the line. He's been the wallet for Ms. Almanza's two kids for the past five years, and now he's got doubts big enough to fill the courtroom. He's not just stopping at a paternity test. He wants a lie detector thrown into the mix to see if there's been any side action. Ms. Almanza, standing her ground, is confident that the DNA dance will show Mr. Brock is indeed the dad. Buckle up, because this is about to get bumpy. You have petitioned the court requesting a paternity test to determine if you are the father of the children in question and the one she is currently carrying, as well as a lie detector test to determine if she has been cheating. Ms. Almanza, you've also petitioned the court for a lie detector test, and you're confident that today's DNA results will prove that Mr. Brock is the father of your children. Mr. Brock dives into a backstory that's more tangled than last year's Christmas lights. He recounts the early days of their relationship, which sounds more like a romantic game of musical chairs than a fairy tale. Apparently, the relationship started when both were rebounding, and just as he was about to exit another relationship. Hold on to your hats. This timeline is wild. Well, basically, she laid up with somebody that was a, a mutual friend of ours, right? During that time, she got ended up pregnant, and I, 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 I ended that up... Was because we weren't in an exclusive relationship. Oh, so friends are ball game when it's not exclusive. And then, you know, I, technical difficulties, I ended up getting incarcerated. Well, during that time. From technical difficulties. From technical difficulties. Ms. Almanza throws down the emotional gauntlet. She's not just upset, she's disgusted that Mr. Brock would question the paternity after all this time. And while they're still sharing a roof and a bed, this drama is thicker than a bowl of oatmeal on a cold morning, and it's just heating up. It, dis it disgusts me because we're living together. We've been in a relationship so you know if i'm having these babies they're not i'm not having them by myself or with anybody else despite of all of that he's still the one that's messing around so let me but get this straight you're currently living together yes. you are obviously pregnant, pregnant and you just said he's still messing around yeah, I'm okay, pretty sure good. he but is. She I'm pretty sure DNA he test is. Before, so Plot twist. Mr. Brock previously threw a paternity question mark into the mix, which had Ms. Almanza scrambling for legal support for the kiddo. She claims she was left out of the loop on the DNA test. Talk about a communication breakdown. This episode is serving up more twists than a pretzel factory. He questioned paternity, and from what he tells me, they sent me a paper asking me to come in for the DNA test. I never got anything. But so this fueled your doubt? Uh, yeah. But I still this... took her word for it. She gave me a line like, I'm the I'm the father, so I wouldn't want to do that to you. I wouldn't want to put that kind of energy, you know what I'm saying? I already know that's how I can be. You and got that... a lot of little sayings. I got to keep up with you. You got a lot of little phrases now. Yeah.
Here's where the emotional roller coaster hits a loop. The couple's relationship status? It's complicated. Mr. Brock labels it a roller coaster, which might be an understatement. Ms. Almanza accuses him of missing out on family time, painting a picture of a partner who's there, but not really there. Fasten your seatbelts. This ride isn't over yet. We're a like roommates. Ride. It's a We're like coaster. roller coaster. Ride. It's a roller coaster ride. <laughs> okay. Ms. Almanza, <laughs> what is the state down. of your relationship? When it comes to him, I try to talk to him. At me. the same time, when it comes down to family time and things with my children, it's always me doing things. It's, he's never involved. He was involved in my baby shower. He was there. So if he doesn't feel that he's the father, why was he there? So that's um, a picture from your baby shower. This is a picture from my baby shower. He was there. And here come the DNA results. Drum roll, please. Mr. Brock, you are the father. <laughs> that is something this woman still sees in you. On your face right here today after you failed every question now, in this lie you, detector we, we test. Love each other. Stop talking and listen. <laughs> You have a beautiful young woman that loves you, despite your faults. She has pretty much been waiting on you to grow up, and it's time to be a man.